slowly, because I know I'm speaking a foreign language for most of you. I speak American, and most of you speak some other foreign language. I think it's called the Queen's English or something, or New Zealandish. And then I'm going to start with a joke. This kind of sets the, this is going to set the bar. It's going to be downhill from here. So if this joke is like killing you, then you should set your expectations properly. Um, what's the most fearsome baked product? None of you have kids. Attila the bun. I told you, that's, that's going to be the high point, so get ready. Um, that's me. This is all the places to find me. Uh, are, this, I, this, I have high hopes for this conference. How many of you are Ingress players? That is the largest number I've ever seen at a show. How many of you are green? You are no longer my friends. You're like, all green. Can we work out a deal where like you guys, I'll put blues, but don't shield them, just so I can take them out. I, we'll both, we'll work on leveling here, okay? So um, that's all the other places you can find me if you want. Again, that yellow URL is the URL to the talk. So if you want to follow along on your own laptop, that's where you find it. Or if you want to bookmark it, because you're going to do something else now and you'll come back to it later. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of cloud education at the beginning. Uh, the main thing though that I, well, I already put up the slide, so I might as well talk to it. So this is going to be very quick for this part because I only have 20 minutes. For some reason they want to keep me short, not in just my height. Um, so infrastructure as a service, does everybody know what that is? Who's the largest infrastructure as a service provider in the world? Amazon. Thank you. Are you work there? Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay, I get, my, I get my reference fee. No, so that's Amazon there, right? Who, and some others are Azure. You, can think, you guys know Rackspace here? Does Rackspace even have a presence here? Yeah! Right, those are infrastructure as a service. So change the landscape for all of us, right? And most of you, how many of you are sysadmins? How many of you are developers? It's a good, nice mix. How many of you are both and don't like one of the other roles? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a developer mostly, and I hate, I can, sys, well, I can't say that, I have sysadmin Linux machines, and it's always been torture for me, just because I always feel like I'm, is, is fuck a word that you guys know in New Zealand, or is that a cultural term? I always feel like I fuck it up, and so what ends up happening is I'm like, oh, I just left PHP wide open, my machine will be rooted. So I like PaaS, because it, well, we'll get to that in a second. So infrastructure as a service, great, in basically a couple minutes, I get my machine up and running, right? No more procurement procedures, no more racking and stacking, you basically have a machine in a couple minutes, and then you can shut it off right away, no fixed investment. For those of you who support developers or are developers, this is not a good solution for us, though, because we're either you're still having to help developers with all the nasty calls of like, I need Node.js installed, and it has to be ready on Friday at 5 o'clock because I got this big project on the weekend, right? Or you're a developer, and you still have to admin a Linux machine. Software as a service, okay, take off your corporate hats, although I imagine at this show most of you are not big enterprise people. Who's the largest software as a service provider? I promise not to bite, you can yell out. It's the end of the day. Who said Google? Microsoft. No, Google is the biggest software. How many of you have a Gmail account? Yes, and so there's about six billion people in the world. Every one of them has four email accounts, so that's about 24 billion software as a service users right there. So Google is by far the largest software as a service provider. Paz is in the middle and it's really t geared at helping sysadmins and developers get along. Right? It does a clear separation of concerns. So the sysadmins set up the PaaS, and then the PaaS takes care of handling all the configuration and stuff so that developers can self-administer. They can spin up a node application with one slot, with one command. And I think that comes here. Right? Can you guys see that green on black? Kinda? Let me see if I can make it a bit bigger. No, at this point the browser says no. So basically that's how I spin up a PHP application. Right, it's one command, and it spins up Apache that belongs to the user, it's all locked down inside containers, and it's ready to go, and I've got a git repo, and I just git push. The sysadmin has to do nothing. And the developer has their de whole application development environment ready within a minute or two. Right, so that's awesome. And then you just go in, and then you just do git commits, and it does as a push, and it does a deploy, and then you're all, it's like magic. As a developer, I never want to go back to setting up AMIs again. That is misery to me. Right? And so that's what PaaS brings. And it's good for sysadmins, but that's a different talk. Okay? I'm not going to actually demo it. So OpenShift has been around, and Cloud Foundry has been around about the same amount of time. Uh, the, who's the longest living PaaS provider out there right now? Heroku. Who said that? Nicely done. Heroku, is the, you said it also? You need to speak up, sir. Um, Heroku is the longest, what? <laughs> Okay. 
And, and there, is the, there is a grain of truth in every stereotype. Um, so uh, Heroku's been around the longest, but it's basically a pretty new technology, but we're already writing our new version, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today for OpenShift. But it's not going to be like, yeah, you totally have to use OpenShift. I'm actually just going to be talking about the technology in it. Um, why? Because this space has moved a lot in three years. And running one of the uh, second to Heroku, probably the largest PaaS out there, we've learned a lot about how to run PaaS. We have a public hosted version. Um, more people are becoming fo fo focused on PaaS, and there's been a lot of movement in this area. And finally, we want to combine the best user experience with the best underlying technologies that are coming out. So that's why we decided, hey, just let, we'll ignore Joel Splosky. We're going to rewrote the whole thing again from scratch. Right? So to start this out, we need a good bottom layer. And we, for that, we're using Atomic. I'm imagining at this crowd, I should get more than two hands up for how many of you have heard of Red Hat, uh, the Atomic project? OK, still not enough. Mark, make a note to Joe that he needs to do more work about raising awareness. So uh, Project Atomic is basically a stripped down and optimized for deployment into the cloud. It's, Basically what we do is, if you want to say it simply, you take RHEL and you strip everything out except for the core pieces that come with like the kernel, systemd, journaldd, the logging facilities, basically all the core pieces of Linux and you strip everything else out. Right? And then everything else is coming as a container. And that's what this is about. Right? It's stripping down the OS to its core pieces and then everything else is going to come as a container. It also has some other fun stuff, uh, OS tree for the file system, and what this allows, I don't, do I talk about it? No. So I'm going to talk about it all here. Basically, it's, you can set up the entire update on the server and then pull it down and update the machine. So it's almost like Git for your entire system updates, right? And that you can do with Project Atomic as well. And it's got the same kernel, though, as RHEL or Fedora. Well, Fedora is a little bit ahead, but you can run Atomic on it as well. Right? And why does kernel matter? For, I'm assuming everybody in here has heard of Docker. Is that right? Yeah? In this audience, I'm assuming almost, has everybody tried Docker? Yeah? No? Well, I'm not gonna, yeah, call out in front of all your, your like, other Linux enthusiasts that you know nothing about Docker. I won't do that to you. Um, it's got the same, it's got a great kernel, right? So it's the same kernel that we support with RHEL. So check out Project Atomic. Then on top of that, we're putting Docker. And I, when I say Docker here, I should actually say containers in general. But we're at this point, I mean, Rocket's only, where's the Rocket guy? He's here in the audience. There he is. Rocket's like only a month and a half old, right, at most. How long is the announcement? Uh, yeah, like six weeks ago. Six, six weeks, month and a half. Yes. OK, so it's only like a month and a half old. So it can be any container. But right now, the clear leader in the container system is Docker. So we're going to talk about Docker for today. Does everybody know? Uh, can I go through this fast? <laughs> okay, so this is important. Well, I'll just go to this. Well, no, let's do this. Everybody knows this, though, like with linking containers, that you can... Well, I'll just go to the last slide, because it says it, right? Um, so what's the pros of Docker or containers? You get extreme application portability, right? All that we need is we need a machine that has a kernel on it, and we can take this machine and move it around. Uh, it's very easy to create and work with derivative images, and it's fast boots, right? Because of a very low resource consumption. The cons is it's a host-centric solution. Docker by itself is, you can't talk to other machines through Docker by itself, right? Containers on separate machines can't talk to each other, but out of the box. <clears throat> there's no higher level provisioning and there's no developer workflow. So that for me, when I, about, I don't know, eight months ago when they started, everybody, like the buzz really started building for Docker, I was like, oh, I'll give this a try. Because everyone in our team was like, oh, Docker's the new wave. And it basically I left very disappointed because I've used a pass before. So what Docker feels like to me is like AMIs on your local machine, which is great, again, but it doesn't give you all the things that you want as a developer. Sysadmins, you guys probably love it, right? Or you've, okay, wait, uh, um, conference talk etiquette. I'm from New York, originally, in case you can't tell. And guys is a gender, yeah, right behind the Canadian. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. Kernel of truth, man. Um, so, now I forgot where I was going. <laughs> Oh, guys is a gender neutral term for New Yorkers and East Coasters in the United States. Guys, women say guys to other women. Guys just means folks. Okay? So please don't take that personally. Um, it has nothing to do with any of the substance of the talk, but has everything to do with how people might interpret it. So, Kubernetes. So I saw how many hands went up. Unless everybody who's never heard of Kubernetes left, there are very few people in this room who've actually heard of or used Kubernetes. Is that correct? Yeah, that's because it takes a while to get from Mountain View down here. Is that like when it goes across the ocean? It takes a little. 
<laughs> Attila the bun. Um, so Kubernetes terminology, Kubernetes has a node, right? And in, it's a Docker host running the whole Kubernetes. Oh, it runs all the service. A node is kind of like the machine running all the stuff. On there you have pods, and that's one or more linked containers, right, in Kubernetes speak. And then you can put pods together to form a service. And I'll get to that in a little bit. And then a collect, collect, so a Kubernetes node is also used to be called a minion. They, I think they've now settled on calling it a node, a Kubernetes node. It used to be called a minion. Um, and a cluster is a collection of one or more Kubernetes nodes. Okay? And, and I take questions during the talk, although who's in charge of time? Is it you? You are now? It's just you? Uh, how, how are we doing? I, you're good. You have, you have like 15 minutes. Okay, good. Um, so please ask questions during, because if you don't get this part, it's kind of hard to understand the rest. Oh, by the way, a little self-promotion and actually more promotion for Katie. Katie and I are giving this talk in a 45-minute version with much more in-depth and much better delivered, because Katie's way better than I am, um, on Thursday. Okay, so if you want to come learn more in-depth or see it again or really just want to hear more atrocious jokes, come to the Thursday session. <clears throat> so any questions on this? I'll repeat the question if any, so we don't have to run around with the mic. I feel bad for your legs already. You're good? A kublet? It's coming. Thank you for that softball. Um, so there's the node daemon, right? So this is the daemon that runs on the node, and that's the kublet, right? And its primary responsibility is pod metadata and management. Right? It maintains a record of the pod state. So when you have that pod, a pod can have one or more containers inside of it, and the basic the idea of the kubelet is it says, this pod is supposed to have these containers running in it, and what state is it in? It basically tracks pods. And it takes instructions from the, the cluster master. Right? So the master will say things to the kubelet, do this, make the state look like this. Did I go too fast? Yes. So the other thing that's on nodes is the Kubernetes daemon, or Kubernetes proxy. And what this allows you to do through the pro Kubernetes has this concept of labels. And based on labels, you can say, like in this example, we have P1 app 1 and P2 app 1. Those are both examples of pods that are app 1, named app 1. And what the, ser the proxy does is it says any request that comes into any of the, of the, ku the any of the minions, the Kubernetes, what do they call it again? I'm used to minions. The Kubernetes knows any, thank you for people who have memory better than this 45 year old. Um, anything that comes into any of the nodes will know where to get routed. Right, so the request can come into any node and the proxy will say, oh, you're talking about P app one, I have two versions of it and I'll send it to one of those. Okay? And it maps a common port, too, on every node to the relevant across the entire cluster. It can, just so for reference purposes, it can forward both HTTP and UDP. Right? This is not OpenShift that we had before, or a lot of the passes before were mostly just HTTP. Right? And this is actually expanding it more. The cluster management, this is the control plane. Right? And what this does is there's a Kubernetes API, which is a REST framework. There is a scheduler, so that its own one job is to choose minions for pods. There's the control manager, so this is the monitoring service for deployed pods. So we've got a pod deployed. It's supposed to be in the state. It's going to keep saying, is it in the right, is it the right configuration? Is it up? Is it running? And then there's the kube config. It's a CLI for working with a Kubernetes cluster. Right? And that comes from the cluster manager. And so part of this cluster manager, when you maintain a cluster, is you've got to change, exchange information. And I, this is a fun graphic, so I can, I can say anything I want at this point, because no one's really paying attention. They're all watching the little dots go by. This is the part where you open your wallets. Ten minutes. Thanks. Um, so et, we use etcd, right? Or Kubernetes uses etcd to exchange all the messages and to make sure everybody's in a consistent state. I'm not going into raft consensus out based algorithms. And then there's a, con, a replication manager, right? And the replication manager you tell it what it needs, and then it goes and builds it out. Right? I need five Nginx pods. <laughs> out it goes and does that for you. Okay? It's decoupled from the proxying. And then the Kubernetes API, or that's just an API to talk into Kubernetes. Those are the terms I talked about before. So that's Kubernetes in a nutshell. So Kubernetes basically is a level on, so we have the atomic OS, 
Then on top of that, we put containers. In our case right now, it's Docker, but it could be Rocket or it could be any other container service. OpenShift had its own containers when we first came out because we actually, does everybody know that Docker used to be a PaaS? Does it, no, see? So there's some little cocktail, you guys are on good cocktail trivia for tonight and tomorrow night. Oh, did you know that Docker actually used to be a PaaS provider? And they did one of the best pivots on the market. They took their container technology and open sourced it and made it Docker. Right? And so we, we do containers now, it's just not standardized the way they do it. So what OpenShift brings on top of it now, oh, and so Kubernetes manages all those different containers. Like Kubernetes you can think of as a management layer. What OpenShift, so what is, why do we need OpenShift? Right? We've got Kubernetes, and we've got Docker, so why does Red Hat think they need to bring anything else? We didn't, and what is different between this one and the last one is, in our last version, we built the whole thing. It was all open source, and there's contributors from all over, but in this one we're like, you know, Docker's better than what we can do by ourselves. And Kubernetes is better than what we can do by ourselves. So we'll take those two great pieces and we'll bring our expertise and layer it on top. And so what does it bring to the party? It builds in a, a built-in software-defined network. You can plug in your own if you want, but for ease of use, we actually do a software-defined network. And the reason we use a software-defined network, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, is basically for keeping apps separate and routing between applications, which is a higher level than even pods and services. A well-defined workflow from code to deployed application. None of these actually show the, like, I wrote some code, now what do I do? Right? Kubernetes doesn't solve that problem. It manages all your pods and your containers and does all that stuff, but as a developer, it, it's not that exciting to me. And so we bring that last mile. And then a much friendlier interface. So this is the, open, the other pieces we bring to the party for building the paths. So the networking layer, we're using open vSwitch. Again, so I, I'm going to say this now. For me, OpenShift feels like Linux. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it's not like Red Hat doesn't own the kernel. It's not like we say, yeah, the kernel's all ours, and we're only going to do what we want to do in the kernel, and then the rest of the distribution is all ours. We're not writing that. We take the, the pieces and bring them together, and then we add pieces where we need, and we contribute to the pieces we think are important. So of the top five contributors to Kubernetes, two of them are Red Hat employees on the OpenShift team. Right? It's not that we're saying we're going to build this all. We're actually actively involved with the community. And so like even here, we're using open vSwitch rather than writing our own software-defined network layer. How are we doing? Five? Five. Okay. Um, it handles IP routing at the application layer. So pods and services, those are one thing. But then you have an an, a complete application, which may be made up of several different services. And you need some way to network in between them, right? in, terms, in terms of isolation and discoverability. And then it provides load balancing. So we, we put HAProxy in its own pod for your application, and then that HAProxy pod will then do the load balancing to all the other applications as well. Right, so there's a built-in load balancer. And you can actually run these pods, multiple pods, so you actually have high availability HAProxy in there as well. So what does an application look like? That, the big white box is an application, and you can see here it's got multiple pods, and on top of that you put multiple services, and then you have replication controllers, so you replicate different parts of it differently. If you think of it in terms of, how many of you have heard of or worked with microservices? Okay, that's not going to be a good analogy then. Um, it's, it's basically like a top level, uh, uh, how many of you have done SOA? Service oriented arc? And still what? And still admit it. And still admit it. <laughs> None. Um, so the idea with an application is it may be made up of many different services, right? With multiple teams working on different parts of the services. An application, a lot of us think of an application as just one thing, like one team works on it and they deliver this application. In this kind of art, what we've found is a lot of people are moving away from that monolithic application, right? And so what they're doing is they're building multiple services and then tying all those services as part of one larger application. And there may be one or two different web interfaces to that same application. The term has taken on new meanings in lots of companies, right? And then, there's, so this is what an application does, and OpenShift manages all those pieces of the application. And it provides the ability to insert things like environment variables. Like suppose all the pieces of your application need to know your GitHub key. Or all the pieces of your application need to know some uh, password or, or uh, database credentials, right? That could actually be managed by OpenShift itself as well. Build options, so we give a couple different build options at this time. One is a Docker builder, right? And the idea with that is you pull a Docker image and you merge the code. 
Source to images, you take a Docker image on your machine and you take source and you run this and it goes and you have a nice thing that you can just deploy. Right? So those are two different ways to take code and build a Docker image that you can then deploy. And then there's build config also, which is a URL for code plus a build type from above and then some webhooks to how I'm going to go get that code. Right, so you can say, here's the URL in this GitHub repo, here's the, the build type from above, go do it. And so what we're trying to get to in the thing itself is a whole application lifecycle rather than just a build. Right, so you can actually specify this kind of stuff. You can specify this though in the source code on a CI system or in an image repository. So the entire product lifecycle is repeatable, fault tolerant, and automated. But the other thing that's, well, I don't have a slide on this either. The other thing that we're allowing is a change in either the Docker images or in the source code can trigger a whole entire build. Right? It's not just, oh, I changed my source I need to rebuild. Oh, I've updated all my Docker image. I've updated this Docker image and I've added some new stuff. That will also trigger a new build of the whole process. Right? So they're each independent and composable systems. How are we doing? Good, you should wrap it up. All right, so uh, are you guys going to be nice? No? No questions. What? I'll give that at the end. Is that okay? Um, what we make easier, configurations, builds, deployments, teams and management. We also bring our concepts of teams and managements, right? Kubernetes has no idea of that about, or this is the pieces you add on top to build a whole platform as a service, right? So we have a project, controls access. We have projects, have hard and soft limits, all this stuff that we add on top to make it more a big product. So that's the end. The takeaway messages for you should have been, one, um, PaaS is, how many of you have used a PaaS or a platform as a service? Okay, for everybody who has not raised their hand, when you think of Red Hat, do you think of nimble little agile startups using our products? Or do you think of like, like Titanic size icebergs or the Titanic itself or like an aircraft carrier moving at very slow speeds and very hard to turn? Startups, right? That's what you usually think of. So if you think of our customer base, we actually have quite a few of our customers coming to us asking for OpenShift. Like our salespeople are in shock sometimes because they'll, the customers will be bringing OpenShift up to them. and it's, I, of course, think it's because it's such a phenomenal product that nobody can live without it. But I think the real thing is that a lot of companies have come to understand that platform as a service makes a lot of sense for them. So if you haven't used it yet, even if you're, and you think you're never going to use it, instead of spending some time watching, what is a big show in New Zealand that everybody likes to watch? Downton Abbey? Are you guys, since you guys have the queen on your currency, you must all watch Downton Abbey, right? <laughs> no? And the Australians, you don't, get out, you don't get a free pass on that one either. I'm sure you still have the queen as well. What? Flight of the, oh, I love Flight of the Concourse. You don't have any, keep watching that. This is not worth it. Um, I th the, uh, <laughs> um, but I do think you should try playing with a pass. Right? As a system, you should try playing with it. As a developer, you should try playing with it. Um, and the other thing is that this is not one of those situations where we think we know the one best way. We're actually leveraging the community again and working with the community. And this is the same kind of story again. So. I'm excited. I think you should learn more about Docker, but almost all of you probably have. But you should learn more about Kubernetes. You should also OpenShift. It's rapidly evolving. Uh, it's all in GitHub origin, openshift.github.com, org, org, dot org. And uh, there's Trello cards and all sorts of fun stuff. And you wanted the slide. There's the URL. So I think we have time for like one question. Yeah, like one or two. Any no, like one. Okay, let me see if this is a question I like. What's your question? Okay. Oh, see, this is going to be a low-level question. I'm not going to like this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kubernetes proxy, yeah. uh, HA proxy, software defined, software defined network, open with switch, and actually CD more or less related. Uh, all these uh, tools uh, kind of solving the same problem. Uh, do you see overlap here? No. So they actually attack different levels of the problem. Which is, the overall problem is how do you network when you have a really like, it used to be easy when we just had a war file, a application server, and you just run that on a machine. Everything happens above it. Oh, he's not calling something out. So th basically, these actually handle different networking problems. So the, the Kubernetes proxy handles connections between pods and services. Right? What HA proxy is doing in this case is, if you have multiple sets of your, if you want high availability in your application as a whole, 
and there's multiple services in t inside of that, HA Proxy is handling it at the application level. It's a level above, right? So they're each, they, they do the same kind of thing, but at different levels in the architecture. And different With different software. Yes, because they have different, so HA proxy is mostly a uh, HTTP load balancer. Kubernetes, pro, uh, the Kubernetes proxy is mostly for dealing with pods and services. So it's much more specialized about dealing with something different. All right, and last question. Yeah. Rather than throw this at the actual more formal one, what part do you currently dislike the most about OpenShift? <laughs> the <laughs> crappy people in the audience that ask questions like that. Um, <laughs> What part do I, that's like that dumb job interview question. What part do you, what's your one flaw? The part I don't, I don't the, how hard my team works. That's the part I don't like because I don't get as many vacations. Is that an appropriate answer? The part I don't like, the current version or the new version? Okay, so with the current version, I'm gonna do the current version because that's the one I spend most of my time on. This is still not finally baked. What I don't like with the current version is there's not a good local desktop to, to OpenShift workflow. Right, it's in the current version, and that's why what I'm loving about the new version that Docker brings with us. In the current version, I have to stand up, like if I was gonna do JBoss development, I'd have to stand up a JBoss server. If I was gonna do a uh, PHP, I'd have to stand up an HTTP server, make sure I have mod PHP in there, do all that stuff on my local machine. And that configuration would still be different than what it would look like the actual real configuration would look different and I'd have to use environment variables differently and all that stuff. So it's not like a clean, like, work on my local machine, develop, 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 and push. And sometimes I don't want to push to the server every time I do a development. So the nice part here with the newer version is that it's going to be work with your Docker image locally, take that exact same Docker image and push it up to the server and you're good to go. All right. Right. So the answer is the local to server deployment. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.